Like, people come to me now like, oh, man, like, you're a marketing genius. I'm like, I'm really actually <laughs> not, man. It was just pure luck. I have the experience. I have the qualifications. I have the expertise. You're just a rugby player. We're taught to not put ourselves out there or like mm. back ourselves I feel out of fear yeah like fear of failure but like what if you just knew you couldn't fail that's why people like going for runs and stuff like that they yeah. attribute the peace to the run mm. but that's a mistake people would be surprised at how much traction and momentum that you can create mm. by doing something truthfully like, nah that just happened by accident we were literally just doing it because we were like oh running it's fun it makes us feel good Grayson, mate, good to see you. Thanks so much for coming on. How are you? Very good to be here, Ollie. I'm very well, man. Good, man. Well, look, thanks so much for taking some time and sitting down. I'm really looking forward to the chat and the kind of conversation to have. I guess we've known each other kind of on and off for, for a couple of years, so I kind of want to start start the start of your life, I guess, a little bit. Um, the one thing I would say about you is obviously you were a professional athlete for quite a few years, right? Over 10 years? Yeah, I think I did 14 seasons professionally. Wow. Yeah. That's manga. <laughs> the first thing now is obviously you're a, you're a brand owner, you're a business owner, you're an entrepreneur. That adjustment, that change in your life, what's that been like? Um, it was probably the most refreshing change I've had. Uh, I mean, well, I guess the only living and career that I knew was professional rugby. Mm. Um, I got my first contract when I was 19. Um and then did that all the way through to I was 32. Um, and I think one of the things I learned was like the game that I loved so much that was like, it, for me, rugby growing up was, it was like a place of, it felt like home, it felt like freedom, it felt like play, it felt like expression. Um, and then when I got the opportunity to fulfill my dream of uh, becoming a professional player, I, I, I kind of like quickly learned that like, wow, like, once you get into this as a career, that's it's treated quite dif quite differently. The experience was quite different. Um, it was very everything was focused on the outcome. Everything everything was sort of like zoomed in in terms of like you were critiqued to the finer details, um, and it was it wasn't it didn't come with the same sense of like belonging and freedom and playfulness and expression that I I think allowed me to be good at it as yeah. a kid and get into the opportunity to get a contract so young. Um, and I remember thinking like, oh, I, if, if this coach, if they just sort of kind of took me under their wing and, and if I felt that they just backed me and believed in me and knew that like, like just letting me do my thing mm. uh, with, with guidelines, of course, and within yeah. the, the team's plan, but like, just that sort of, almost that fatherly like arm around the shoulder and be like, hey, like, man, you're here for a reason. You got this, like, go do your thing. I think that's what I long for the most in um, my rugby career. And I think the way in which the concept in which they do it was very like, tell you what to do, very regimented, very like harsh, very, you know, trying to make guys like tough. And, um, and then, so what was so refreshing for me in business was like, it was like a clean slate. Mm. Uh, I didn't have any expectation of an outcome. Um, I remember being like quite nervous starting the business because I was like, oh shit, I really don't know what I'm doing, but I really believe in uh, this product, this, um, you know, this brand that I'm creating. And so it felt like I was back being a kid again out on the rugby field because everything I did, there was no outcome mm. aligned to it. It was just like, I'm just going to express and learn and play and create and yeah so I think it was an opportunity to find that like freedom and expression that I missed so much in my rugby career yeah that's super interesting do you, do you feel that your professional kind of uh, sports career do you think that set you up very well to go into business because sport teaches you so much right I've never been a professional mm -hmm. athlete so I don't know mm -hmm. but I imagine it teaches you so many things you're talking about some things maybe being more negative but without that experience that you had over 14 years and the way that you operate and where your mind works do you think you would have approached pure sport differently? Yeah, I think the lessons learnt through rugby were were amazing because because what I learnt was, you know, the things that I would like to do and the things that I wouldn't like to do. Mm. Um, I think throughout my career I was someone who 
rather than just following suit and doing what I was told for the sake of it. I, I don't know. I wasn't trying to question or challenge. I was just, it was just naturally within me. It was who I was at school as yeah. well. Um, and you kind of get dis- labeled like disruptive or, or a bad kid or um, not interested or whatever early on. But actually, I think you're just much more uh, clear on where you where you want to put your energy and your mm. attention and your focus. Um, and so I was always like questioning things. And I, and I remember one of the things throughout my rugby career that I, I very much started to question was like, you know, how are these leaders leading? Like, is it from a place of like, we're in this together and come with me? Yeah. Or it's like, hey, like I'm here and I need you guys to do what I say mm. to get the result in order for me to feel okay. Because that must have taught you a lot about them running a business, right? In yeah. terms of experiencing that in probably yeah. a few different ways with the coaches and teams you mm. worked with, right? Yeah. And you took those learnings into it. Yeah, and I think I think the biggest blessing where I took those learnings that I was interested in and um, looking at when I was playing rugby was once we took investment on. Mm. And then that was when, you know, these new concepts to me of like yeah, these yeah. forecasts and all these things that I kind of knew before they were like, it's sort of, to me, it was like a rugby game plan. It was like, yeah, you got a game plan, but like the game plan's there as a guideline. Yeah. And then when you're out there, like you just play the game, you know, yeah, yeah. and you look and you see opportunities. And then the game plan is sort of like there to just keep people aligned for a little bit and then you open up opportunities. I sort of looked at like things like forecasts and budgets and things like that as like the same because you sit there one day and you make it up. Yeah. You, you literally make it up. Yeah, yeah. And I could never understand why when you make something up in a moment, that's not the the present moment of when that thing being made up is actually putting being put into play mm. how can then six months down the line can you hold yourself prisoner to something that you made up six months ago literally sitting here throwing around ideas of what might happen so one of the things that i found interesting in business it was like when you bought investment in and you bought these people that had more experience and you kind of telling you oh like this this uh, thing is real you got to stick to it and you don't want to let people down and like da, 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 da. I, I remember feeling that same f- feeling of like restriction that I would feel as a rugby player when coach would be like, this game plan, you must stick to it and you must not go off script and da da da. And I'd be like, ah, that's, not, that's not the game. Like, that's not how we play it. Like, that's how you, how you create opportunities. Um, and so then I, it was a blessing because I would think back to those things that I had analysed and looked at and learnt about throughout my rugby career. Because I always remember, I was like, I don't want to be like that. Mm. I don't want to be like limited and restricted and mm. leading from fear and making other people feel fear. Like I I'll, I'll always try to take those lessons from rugby and when we had these things like the forecast and stuff like that, I'd be like to my team, I'd be like, hey, like we got a plan and we're going to be open and adaptive throughout the plan yeah. and we're going to find opportunities because opportunities arise in the moment, you know, and pure sport – our greatest performances and our greatest ideas and our greatest execution they've been through adapting and changing and seeing things that have arised as opportunities in the moment mm. um and i think that's something that becomes more and more challenging the more your business yeah. grows because then the more you bring people in that come to a business with a concept of how to do business mm. i never had a concept of how to do business mm. which is why i think pure sport's been different mm. and it's been fun and it's been playful and like i feel the customer connects and resonates with that yeah because they want to i think they want to feel that freedom because maybe they're not getting it in their corporate jobs or yep. you know they're being told what to do or they're yeah, yeah some people don't even know that they're being restricted and limited because they're just in these infrastructures that that's just all that there is and that's, they're taught that that's normal mm. you know so i think people get drawn to something like pure sport because they there's an intuition in them that's like oh they, these guys are just pretty free. They're having a good time. Like mm. I want to be part of that. Yeah. So just to touch on your rugby days a little bit more before we kind of go into pure sport, because that's really what we want to talk about. Mm. But what was your goal in your kind of professional career as an athlete? What, what were you striving to? You were in it for a long time. Yeah. And, and there is a clear pure sport mission, and I want to hear your mission personally with pure sport, but yeah. what were you really striving after with, with the rugby side? And did you achieve it? Uh, oh that's such a good question thanks <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard one to answer because like at first i didn't have a goal i i really just loved rugby 
Yeah. But like I just loved playing the game. It was because yeah. I had quite a challenging childhood um, and rugby was one of the few places that I just felt like I really belong mm. and like I felt happy and like joyful and and also it was one of the few things in my life where people would be like well done man like you did good like I'll be like fuck that's a good feeling because I never got that anywhere else yeah um so it was just nice to feel and then I remember growing up having coaches that maybe they knew that my life outs- outside of that rugby club was quite hard um they were, they were like father figures that you know because a lot of them were dads like yes. when you play at a yeah, junior course, rugby yeah. club it's like one of the other kids dad you know yeah, yeah. um and yeah i know they they'll kind of like sort of look out for me put their arm around my shoulder like encourage me let me know i was doing good um and i just remember one day when i was 17 i just used to muck around at school i didn't take part mm. that seriously uh and i used to just love playing rugby and hanging out with my friends and you know i'd learn some stuff and i'd I was having more fun questioning the teachers about why we're doing certain things or why why don't we learn something like this or why 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 do we have to learn that um which didn't go down well with some of them some of them kind of enjoyed it <laughs> um but I just remember one day when I was like 17 I was like they kept talking about like university or like apprenticeships and like then I was sat there I was like fuck what am I gonna do shit like the real world like I'm not yeah. gonna be able to just come here and have fun anymore with my friends oh and then I was like <laughs> oh I want to try to become a rugby player because that that was like an option for me yeah. that's what well, th- that moment conceptualized that as an option for me for a career yeah whereas before I never thought about that mm. I was just playing it because I really enjoyed it mm. and also by that point I was getting a bit older and like playing for the rep teams and stuff yeah people thought that was cool and like girls thought it was cool and like you know things like that so I was like yeah this is cool I like making the rep teams and that um but then I think so initially I was just like oh it was my opportunity to make something better of my life and not be like a failure Mm. um because before I didn't have any concept so that was really the initial goal yeah would you say it's almost looking for happiness as well a little bit like looking for a little comfort and happiness yeah. and some of the things you say like obviously that you had those challenges in your life but yeah you were playing because mm. you loved it right yeah once once that concept arose i became very driven yeah i became like very like laser focused like oh i'm gonna work hard now i'm gonna like train hard i'm gonna get real fit i'm gonna refine my skills because before that i was just like playing around mm. um so I remember, like, I'd go to the park and I'd, like, kick the ball around. I'd pass it for, like, hours and I'd do, like, sprints and fitness and, like... But it was still, like, I was still having fun with it. Like, my training would be, like, I'd race my friends and we'd practice, like, we'd sidestep each other and we'd kick... We'd, yeah. like, kick the ball as far as we could and, like, pass, pass, like... and But it was refining my skills, but it was just, like, it was fun. Mm. Um, and I think when I had that idea, I remember thinking, I was like, man, if I get a contract, I'm going to feel happy. I'm going to finally feel like fulfilled, like I'm doing something good. Yeah. Because uh, I think growing up in a society like the Western culture that we all live in, if you don't do well in school, if you're kind of getting in trouble, I was getting into like fights and stuff like that. you made to think you're a loser, like you're a failure, like you're a bad kid. Mm. But I knew I wasn't. Mm. I knew I wasn't a loser or a bad kid. I had a good heart. Yeah. I knew my mind was good. I wanted to like do good stuff and, with my life. And like, I don't know, I just enjoyed life and being happy and like yeah. connecting with people but i was sort of made to believe like yeah like you're a bad kid and you're a failure so i i think i remember thinking to myself if i get a contract man like i'm gonna feel so good mm. i'm gonna feel so happy mm. i'm gonna feel fulfilled for the first time in my life and i remember i got the contract and it was such a amazing moment because it came way quicker than I thought it would. Right. Because um, it came out the blue. I just got invited to this trial game. I wasn't in any academy. Some guy got injured, so they needed someone to fill in. And then one of the pro coaches was there. And it was, so it was a just a trial. little bit tri- of luck in Yeah, it was way. like yeah, luck. Yeah. Like, wow. And I got there late. My dad, we got lost on the way, and there was only one uniform left, and it was like 3XL. And I was way smaller and skinnier than all the kids because they'd gone through this whole like, academy yeah, yeah. program. And um, But it was my first time like getting an opportunity like that at that level um and then pat lamb the auckland coach he was there just watching it was an under 21 trial for like new zealand under 21 but i wasn't even trialing for the team they just needed me to fill in and how old are you at this point i was 18 but i was just filling in like because the guy got injured so i was just there i was like fuck yeah this is sick like 
the, it's cool to just play in this. This is a great opportunity. Um, and I just remember my 3XL uniform like tearing around, but I don't even remember the game. But people came up to me after like, man, like that was sick. And I was like, oh, was it? <laughs> like, I don't know. I was just going for it, man, because it was cool. Um, and yeah, then Pat Lamb came up to me after. He was like, hey, I want you to come do preseason training with Auckland. And I was like, oh, fuck, yeah. And I remember going to preseason and uh, all my heroes were there, like all blacks, like guys yeah. that I admired because yeah, yeah. at the time where Auckland was like in its prime Auckland rugby, like dudes I looked up to like Doug Howlett and Joan Kaino and Ethan Athiwa and Ali Williams and Daniel Bray, like legends, like yeah. Sam Tuitapo, guys that had like posters on my wall and I was just like, fuck. So I just like thought it was just so much fun to be there yeah. and so cool. I felt very nervous though. And then I never thought I'd make it. And then he offered me a contract at the end of the preseason. And I played every game that season. We won the competition. Uh, and then it was like I was playing on TV. People thought it was so cool. Like I'd go out to nightclubs and people would be like, Fuck, you're the man. I'd be like, Whoa. <laughs> but I wasn't the man. But it was like, you know, I was like, oh, yeah, cool. Um, but I remember like, so I rode like this. It was almost like a fantasy that first sort of year mm. or so. And everything went so well for me. And then I remember the next season, that kind of like whole like fantasy feeling like kind of wore off and I started to maybe not, I had a couple hard performances, I didn't play as well or whatever. And I remember the feeling of like, I felt like a failure, like that I wasn't good enough, that I didn't deserve to be there. And that was the first time that I clicked that this concept that the, that life gives us that when you get the thing that you believe will make you so happy and fulfilled mm -hmm. it just doesn't work that way because then i was sitting there feeling so frazzled and lost with life because i was like but i thought with every ounce of my being that getting to this point and getting this contract and being this in this career and thing that i thought was going to make me happy that was the that was the golden ticket to living yeah. a happy life yeah and then I felt the opposite and I was like, holy shit. And it took me a long time to like realize that that's not the case. It's a pretty terrifying, I've been there as well. And it's a pretty terrifying feeling because yeah. you kind of feel like you've been working towards the answer. You get the answer, yeah. you get what you want. And then it's not, yeah. it's not how you thought it would be. Yeah. And you're kind of like, well, all this work, all this energy, all this time I've been putting into it. Yeah. Is that all, is that all wasted? I think yeah. on the other side, I've spoken to a lot of people in my time and I always that feeling is always very common and very ambitious and driven mm. people, I think. Mm. They always need to get more and they need to do more in yeah. your life. You're never, you know, you're never satisfied in some way because of that. Yeah. Um, but so mo moving on from your rugby days and, and where you are now, before we get into the amazing band you've been building for the last five years almost. Mm, five years, yeah. What is your mission personally? Um, yeah, my mission spells from that experience mm. and achieving something that I thought was going to make me feel happy and fulfilled, feeling completely lost, going down a pretty dark path for quite a long time, trying to find that happiness and peace that I thought was going to be found in something external. My, through that, I came to explore and understand, to me and, and my experience, where happiness and peace and love and uh, fulfillment truly come from. And yeah. it's not in anywhere external. It's within us all. Mm. It's, um, you know, like a, it's a space of presence or awareness that is the background of all experience, of all thoughts, of all feelings, of all um, perceptions, of all material things. They all play out on this background, this space of awareness mm. that is by nature peaceful and fulfilled and happy and abundant. Um, and when I realised that, that was... A life-changing moment that was the most profound thing and I started to live my life more from that place and it started to go into my everyday life you know this mm. background knowing of love and freedom and peace started to kind of yeah like express itself through day-to-day -day life and it's funny because like it, it, it didn't necessarily mean that like my rugby career like took off like it didn't mean like it became a superstar yeah but I felt fulfilled, mm. I felt free. And then it almost made me realize, oh, I dreamed of being like a big rugby star, but actually maybe I'm here to have gone through this to learn and understand this place of 
uh, fulfillment that is within us all to help potentially point other people to that. Because what I started to notice is when I lived from this place, um, my teammates would, especially the younger ones, and is it not? It was actually not actually just the younger ones. A lot of the older, bigger stars would also come to me and be like, hey, especially on nights out, because rugby is a very like um, bravado game, yeah. you know, like quite a lot of pride and ego yeah. and like I'm the man. Yeah. Um, whereas when on some nights out and a few drinks, some guys would sort of soften and the ego, some would go the uh, completely the other way yeah, and just yeah. be like, okay, yeah. big dog on campus. <laughs> and others would sort of soften a bit. And in those moments when the guys would soften a bit, I'd have lots of people, guys come to me and be like, hey, man, like, what do you know? Like, what is it that you know that makes you, you know, pretty free and peaceful? Like, because you don't get picked every week and sometimes a coach fucking shits on you in the analysis, but, mm. like, you seem, like, happy, like, and chilled, like, and you're also doing things outside of the game that you you don't really mind what people think, you're just being you. Um, and I'll be, and then I'll just talk to him about my experience of what I learned about looking outward to try achieve and uh, find peace and happiness that I've that I learned the hard way that that's not where you could find it and it made me turn inward to to look for you know who we really are mm. and what I learned was that's not something personal that's not wasn't just for me I I realized this this is something available to us all mm. um and i think my mission since then and i think pure sport is actually a vehicle to share that mission uh is to share that like because i think once you see something like that you can't unsee it and then you you can't not want to share it to the world because you realize that the suffering the egotistic uh materialism like the the pain, the greed, the divisiveness that is so like rampant in this world, it stems from people not knowing who they are mm -hmm. and trying to find more and trying to feel better. Because I, I, no one is inherently like a bad person. Mm. Like people do bad things because they feel lost and hurt and not good enough. Yeah. Whereas I think, yeah, my mission has been to just live that and express it and i've been so fortunate that like i've started this business from that place mm. of knowing that uh and i realized yeah like for me when i started people there was no outcome in mind i d i literally didn't know anything about business yeah i had no outcome people used to be like do you have a business plan i was like oh i want to like create these products because i believe in them and i think that will help people understand that the way that the world's telling us to look after our body through pharmaceuticals and coping mechanisms and mm. it's not actually the way mm. it's a it's a short-term fix or it's a band-aid it's actually probably getting in the way of people feeling more free and um living healthier and but i also saw that timing of the industry with products like cbd and mushrooms and nootropics as a opportunity to turn people inward Mm -hmm. into like how am i living my life because yeah this world we live in man it's geared to a, uh, to cater to the ego mm -hmm. and the ego points you out for more do you, do you think too many people are worried about the outcome and the goal as opposed to the journey of getting there yeah i think so because because the outcome or a goal is a concept right like no outcome or goal is a truth mm. but there's nothing wrong with having ambition and mm. there's absolutely nothing wrong with having a goal but if that if the goal and the ambition is a pursuit with the idea of that you're going to feel more or mm. better when you achieve it it's coming from insecurity mm -hmm. whereas if you know in any moment i am the ability to be happy and fulfilled is right here within me now uh you can if, and if a goal arises from that place that's a beautiful goal yeah like that's different you know and and don't get me wrong like it will there'll be times where the the, the ego or uh pride or whatever will come if you if a goal or an ambition arises from that place the ego or the pride will like come in and try to like 
hijack that goal. Mm. But it's it's normal. You just question where you're coming from. And how do you feel? Do you feel bound up? Do you feel lacking? Do you feel agitated? Do you feel stressed when you're pursuing something? Or do you feel free and playful and open and present? And then that's the gauge. Because I think stress and pressure and agitation are it's your body's sign and signal that you're doing something from the wrong place. It's not necessary that what you're doing is wrong. Mm-hmm. It might be what you're doing is wrong, but it's actually it's your body's signal to be like, hey, like come back inward and explore where you're coming from with this pursuit. And yeah, man, some of the most profound things in people's lives happen when they had a goal to go one way and then that didn't go to plan or life had different plans than their yep. goal and then they'd have no choice but to shift and pivot and it opens them up to the most beautiful path that's true to them. Mm. But at the time, that's very uncomfortable because yeah, your yeah. ego and, and all that's like, nah, like, I had a goal, <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to achieve that, yeah. you know. Um, so it's also like, it's just the knowing that you can have a goal, but man, like, it's actually not in your control at mm. the end of the day. Mm. It, like, you can do things and take steps and... Um, and that takes me back to pure sport. I think one of the biggest blessings was, and I still got a tweet that I, we were talking about Twitter before. <laughs> I still got a tweet that I wrote down right at the start, which was, I have, uh, I don't know how pure sport, the outcome will uh, arise. Um, but one thing I do know is I can't fail if I continue to learn and evolve and grow and understand so so perhaps what I was trying to say, and that's not word for word the tweet, so I don't do that very well, but um, pretty much what I knew was there is no outcome to define success. If you are learning and growing and evolving and understanding yourself throughout the process um, and sharing that with other people, like you can't fail. Yeah, for sure. Because why, why commit so much time and effort and energy with the idea that this is the only outcome that su- means success? Like I think when it's, you might it's, never it's, achieve yeah. it. And there's a lot of pressures. You know, we all put pressure on ourselves a lot, the external pressures, yeah. societal pressures, etc. Yeah. What what's been the biggest struggle for you in moving, you know, five years into pure sport? What has been the, the hardest challenge for you personally? Not the business, not mm. the economy and all that kind of stuff. But what is what has really been the hardest thing for you in building what you've built? Um If I had my could have my time over again. I would have really tried to understand what it meant to take on investment. Um, really? Mm. Interesting. Because that was last year, wasn't it? I don't know how much you can talk oh, about that, but it was last year, year before last? We did, we've had three rounds of investment. Yeah. Um, we've, we've done, we did an initial... Crowdfunding no, thing, right? We've had two rounds of investment. Yeah. We, we did an initial 250000 just through friends and family, and then we raised $1.8 million yeah, end remember. of last year. Yeah, yeah. Um, Congrats on that, by the way. And that economy that you raised that in was pretty, uh, pretty yeah. epic. That was cool, and it was like, but as well, like I didn't. Again, I didn't have many concepts and understanding of like business and how to grow a business. So I was very um, influenced by like yeah. what was going on around me, and what I learned was there was a bit of a trend and a craze about like growing quickly and rapidly and growing your revenue, and mm-hmm. and that it was cool to raise capital. You know, Especially like, in COVID, oh, right? COVID, yeah. I mean, it was ridiculous. Yeah. Like everyone was raising yeah. crazy amounts. And when amounts. you're a founder and you're in a startup and everyone's hyped about fast growth and like uh, ra- and like raising capital, like like the amount of people that like when you raise capital and you close around, like, oh, congratulations, man. Like, wow. And you're like, I was like, fuck, it is actually cool that people believe in this enough to invest in it. But like it's now really about what you do with it, mm. you know? Um that it's only the beginning and people yeah. like congratulating you it's like i guess it's something like when people you get a contract you're like congratulations man like but now that's just the start mm. you know um why was that a struggle for you why was the investment is it are you talking about the the bigger piece the bigger thing last um, year because when you bring investment in you you're bringing in people who potentially especially if the business was created as a vehicle to express a passion of showing people and pointing people inward to Mm. who they really are, Mm. um, that has to come with a lot of authenticity. Yeah. Um, When you raise investment, 
the people are investing because they want to make money. Yeah, yeah. You know? Um, so, but also, like, there's nothing wrong with having a growing business and making money. Like, actually, like, that's what makes the vehicle more profound and powerful mm-hmm. if it's, like, moving in the right direction. And it can have more impact as well, yeah. right? So there's benefits yeah. to it. So I think the... That, that's just been a challenge. It's not a bad thing. No. It's, it's been a challenge to learn how to balance that mm. and how to um, be aligned with people that are maybe in it for different reasons and yep. the purpose. Um, because what I have learned is, like, there are some profound business people that are just very, like, their their purpose, their drivers to, to make money, mm-hmm. and like oh, fair enough, that cool. as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no matter what. And like, good on you, man. Like, yeah, yeah. fair play. Um, you said at the start of that, if you had your time back, <coughs> I'm reading between the lines a little mm-hmm. bit there. But mm-hmm. would would you have not raised the capital at the time? Would you have done it in a different way or anything like that? I would have liked to have understood the change and dynamics that it would have created mm. to ensure that I was equipped and aware, and and but also. By understanding that, like, I, I would have made it really clear to the people that invested, are you on board with this mission? Mm. Like, because this is the number one. But I, I, I actually think that Pure Sports success is, I think it's 100% down to the mission. Like... Interesting. Because I'm, it's not that hard to create a brand and create a product like you don't actually need that much capital and Mm. a lot of things that are out there are there's multiple versions of them yeah i mean i'm sure you would say that some of your products there are very similar opportunity like cheaper or similar whatever but it's not that's not what makes it successful right yeah so i think people buy into feeling part of something yes and uh for me, pure sport and the products, they're an opportunity, like I said, to like point people in, challenge the status quo, question yep. the, the the concepts that I feel are holding people like in mm. place and um so yeah, I think that I I'll just I would have liked to have understood it more clearly. Um, but again it's just an ongoing opportunity yeah. to, to continue to do that. It's not it's not a bad thing. Mm. I think being able to raise capital and have people believe in your your mission and your vision, like that's a, such an amazing thing. And it's something incredible. I've always been very grateful for. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I mean, we're gonna we're gonna talk a lot about pure sport, but before we do, what what do you feel now going through the change you've gone through as a as a business owner as an entrepreneur? What, what do you think one of the biggest myths is that really exists around that? One of the biggest myths, if you, from my perspective anyway, that 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 anyone knows better than you. And that's going to sound quite, I don't mean that in an arrogant sense, but like if you've started your business with a, from a place of authenticity and with a true vision, because I didn't have any business experience, I, I believe too much. And I, I have had at times where I've believed too much in that people that have more experience than me, that their concepts of what, to do are more meaningful or better than mine Mm -hmm. whereas a concept's a concept a Mm -hmm. concept's a recycled idea yeah right and actually the most profound and impactful ideas are fresh and current and in the moment Mm -hmm. and you have started your business you had the an amazing idea Mm -hmm. the fact that you're building something that you're doing something that these other people are interested enough to give you advice you should take massive confidence in yourself Mm -hmm. And the thing that my biggest learning advice would be is speak to people, respect people, be grateful for their advice and take it as an opportunity to question yourself and your ideas and help refine your direction. But never take any advice as gospel and never implement advice in just black and white. Like, oh, I'm going to take that and do that as they say it. Mm. Just take like... You know, yeah, you you have started something, you have created it, you are on the path that you're on because that's what's I within you. Are. Yeah, yeah. So sure. don't question that. Back it and use these things to allow that to bring the best out of you mm. rather than be like, oh, 
because there's been times where I'd be like, oh, yeah, they've got X amount of experience and they've built this and they got this idea and they're telling me that. Mm. And because of someone that doesn't have a background or the experience, then I'll be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to take that and do that. Yeah. 99% of the time, that, that those ones didn't work. Mm. What did work is if I would have an idea or a direction or a, a, a way that I wanted to go or something, and I felt that I wanted to like get advice or or learn from other people, yeah. I would hear what they had to say and I would use their perspective to question my perspective. And then I would walk away and I will maybe tweak my perspective or change it. Or I'd, I would actually hear it and then I'd be like, fuck, nah, I'm, I'm on the right path here. I'm going to back my 100%. Mm. Or I'd take their information, their concept and question mine, refine a little bit and then go. Those are the things that were the most powerful. Yeah. Um, because... This world teaches us to do things by like a, a a textbook, like recycled ideas and just do it. It never works. Everything you said so far, you come across, and I know I already kind of know this, is like someone who really wants to find out for yourself as opposed to listen to what anyone else is saying in some mm. ways from what you're doing within rugby, what you do within the school, what mm. you're talking about with pure sport. Like you seem like you're wanting to find out the answer for yourself as much as you'll listen to someone telling you that's not going to work. You want to know it's not going to work before mm-hmm. before you go further. Am I, am I right in saying that? Yeah, I think so. But it's all. I think it's like we're taught to not put ourselves out there or like mm. back ourselves, I feel. Interesting. Um, out of fear. Yeah. Like fear of failure. But like what if you just knew you couldn't fail? Like, you yeah. can't, f- like, failure is a concept. Yeah, yeah. Like, some of the greatest things in life have come out the back of what people th- would have labelled as a failure. Mm. Um, and My favourite is WD-40. You know the spray? Yeah. It's called WD-40 because it's the 40th attempt. And that's yeah. why it's called WD-40. Oh, stuff like that is just that's little cool. things, you know, yeah. the light bulb, all that stuff. It's yeah. so true. And I think that you're completely right, and I, I completely agree with you, that failure is just a weird thing that people are so f- afraid of yeah. talking about and discussing yeah. and, and even doing themselves. You know, yeah. they just always want to be successful. And yeah. and I think it's becoming more of a thing within social, etc. that people are starting to speak about their failures a bit yeah. more, have more of that conversation around those things. Yeah, yeah. Because um, I think the concept of failure is, is even just like the whole idea that failure, what it means, it's not real. Yeah. Like, nothing's final. yeah. And it might not be the way that you thought it would be or it might have to change in a whole different direction, but that's not a failure. No. Like, you're you're still who you are here and now in that present moment. But you're just stronger. Yeah, and I, yeah, and like, I think people fear, fear things not happening the way they would like it or the outcome not going the way they would like it so much sometimes that it just stagnates them. Mm. Whereas I, if you speak to people that, something completely hasn't gone to plan and what people call a failure. I would say if you question them how they felt in that moment within themselves of who they were, they would be like, I'm the same person. Yeah. I'm, I've still got the same capacity to live my life and enjoy my life and mm. express myself on the other side of what people are calling a failure. Yeah. And that's something unbelievably liberating. Mm. Like... You, you almost become like uh, indestructible and infinite because like, oh, something I feared so much as, and it seems so bad and that I really didn't want that to happen and now I'm here and then you're, and then you're like, fuck, I'm all good. Wow, now what can I do? Yeah. You know, and I learned that um, the thing I feared the most growing up was uh, my dad dying and when I was 21, my dad died and I went through the worst time because that was like the worst possible thing that could happen to me. And then I was kind of, I went down quite a dis- destructive sort of a path because I was like, fuck this world, man. Like took yeah. away the one thing that I never wanted to lose. And and then I remember one day I just woke up, I was like, man, like, hey, you can't live your life this way. Yeah. And then And then I had this like feeling of just like peace and I was like, the, the, the thing you feared the most in life happened, but if you really look at yourself, you're okay. And then I and then I, f- I just took that knowledge that I'm okay, that that could never leave me. Mm. Like even in amongst the time where like the thoughts were sad or the circumstances weren't good or the feelings weren't good, 
it wasn't a feeling it was just a knowing it was the background knowing of where the feelings and the thoughts and the perceptions were arising that that was okay mm. and i was like oh that's who i am and the worst thing that i could ever dream of happening has happened and that's okay and that's who i am i'm just going to live from there wow. and, then, and then i was like fuck that's 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 what people mean when they talk about resilience Mm. resilience isn't like a thought or a concept or an idea it's just the knowing that it's almost an action right it's almost partly an action of resilience in some way because you want to go through that process and go through those experiences to gain it right yeah yeah well i think a kid is resilient and mm. they've not gone through really any experiences yeah, yet like true. much and and i think it's because they didn't have a concept of what they might lose or what's bad you know like yeah. a kid saying perceive like they fall down and they hurt themselves and then once that initial pain is gone, like the physical pain, they're like, yeah, if I crack it on with life. Yeah. You know? Whereas as we grow, we get these concepts of, oh, that's bad, that shouldn't happen to you, and you hold on to the thought of that, and they layer up, and mm. you... I think our natural state of being is resilient mm. and free and creative. Uh, but... So, so actually going through something really hard and difficult, it blows that concept apart. Yeah. If you allow it to, yeah. Otherwise, you just if you don't allow, if you don't allow yourself to look inward to see that now you're actually good, you you keep layering up concepts and you get further away from mm. your your resilience and your peace and your freedom. Um, yeah. Wow. So let's talk about pure sport. Really, the uh, the uh, exciting part, I guess, in some in some ways. I mean, firstly, I'm a massive fan of pure sport and what you guys are doing. I think that exciting to see the next five years after five years of building mm. the first thing obviously to really understand is we've spoken a little bit about mission and drive what what, what do you define as the mission of a pure sport now um i i think for me pure sport is it's just a it's a community and it's a space uh for people to know that you're good enough as you are in a world to me that is trying to tell us that we're not good enough and that we need more yeah. For me, pure sport is like a stripping back. Like, I, I'll, I mean, no one's, you can't be perfect, but like, I've always done my very best to try to promote the brand and the product and the community in, in a way that, like, you don't need more. Like, you don't need this to be mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Know that you're okay. And if it makes sense to use this to help optimize you that's the way to use it. Like I remember uh, someone asked me the other day, um, what product should I use to improve my mental health? And what pure sport products yeah, is, really? Yeah, and because like we have products that help with like cognitive function yeah. and focus and energy and stress. Um, and I said, and, and I was like, man, like that's what's wrong with marketing and selling stuff these days is like, People are trying to provide a coping mechanism. Or a direct solution. Yeah. 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 And then it just becomes like a, it just becomes another layer getting you further away from the fact that you're already okay and you just need to look and see it. Mm. Um, so I think, I can't remember exactly what I said, but I said, I said, hey, like, and it was a like direct message. So I just said, hey, man, like, no product of ours will improve your mental health. Mm. Um, you were to ask me my own personal perspective on that the only way to know that or, or to improve your mental health is to be here and be present in this very moment and then you'll start to see that all the thoughts and concepts of why you're not okay they can't exist here and now you know mm -hmm. that's why people like going for runs and stuff like that they yeah. attribute the peace to the run mm. but that's a mistake it's not the running it's the fact that you're just not attaching to all your thoughts or what's wrong yeah. or the worries about the future or the concept of the past. Mm -hmm. You're just here and now. And then, the, but then because we're so, we love cause and effect as mm -hmm. humans. So we're like, oh, it was the run that caused that. Yeah. And then people get obsessed with running. Yeah. And they're like, running's my savior. Yeah. It's not. It's just being you in the moment. Mm -hmm. And you can be you in the moment anytime. Like you are being you in the moment now. Mm. I'm being me in the moment now. Uh, we're just not attaching to thoughts of like, what do I need to do okay to make my business work? And yep. like, what are those people thinking of me? And what are, oh, like that was difficult, what I faced in the past. 
just here and now and none of those ideas exist mm. and so pretty much i try to point them to that and i said and then from that place of knowing you are all good as you are if it arises that you'd like to research like ashwagandha or lion's mane or yep. one of these products and it makes sense to you to utilize that to optimize mm -hmm. yourself as you are not to fix it or as a coping strategy then that's the way to use the product yeah but it's not to fix you no. it can't fix you no. if you think it's going to fix you you're actually it's it's causing a detrimental effect mm. you're getting further away from the solution it's become another vice or yeah. a coping strategy you know it's why people there's nothing wrong with drinking a beer but if you drink a beer to make yourself feel better then there's a problem because it becomes a vice right so refreshing yeah. especially from brand owners to hear this you yeah. know that stuff because it's you know as you're saying some people are looking at the, the top line numbers and the bottom line numbers but it's mm. clear that for pure sport you actually want to impact people's lives as cliche as every brand will say there is mm. a real drive and passion to do that right yeah yeah and like I, I think people would be surprised at how much traction and momentum that you can create mm. by doing something truthfully yeah um and because I've been amazed, man. I'm so thankful I had no idea about anything to a business mm. when I started. Um, but I've been amazed. Like, one of the challenges is business growing, and I brought people in with like real expertise. They got all these ideas and concepts of how to do something. And when sometimes I sit there, I'm like, ah, oh, that doesn't make sense, man. That's not good. Like, we're not going to do that. They get real offended. Mm. Because they're like, no, but I have the experience. I have the qualifications. I have the expertise. You're just a rugby player. And I'm like, we don't like argue, but it's like, that's where they're coming from. It's like... Did yeah. you feel a lot of that? Just touching on that. Did you feel a lot of that in the early days where you felt very underqualified in the rooms you were going? Because I, I felt that. I mean, I started my business at 17, right? So I had mm. sort of age not working my favour, experience not working my favour, yeah. etc. But did you feel that as well? That kind of feeling of stepping into rooms feeling out of your depth because of your knowledge or, or do you feel that the passion drove you through all that nah because I've when I, what I realised early on in my life that when I had that moment of like oh shit like rugby and all these material things they don't make me better or fulfilled like it's within mm. and then the thing of like losing my dad and be like fuck the worst thing that I ever dreamed of happened and I'm okay and then that was looking within. It made me realise when I would interact with people, and I saw it through my rugby career, there were some big dogs who earned a lot of money who were superstars, and I would look at them and be like, fuck, you're not all good, man. Like, you're not happy. Mm. Like, you're outwardly, like, like you're putting on a, f a show, like, that you're good, but, like, I see, like, you're that's a show because you're not feeling good. Yeah. So, so, so I think from the, that knowledge... I never felt inferior to anyone. Mm. Like, I would sit with, I would sit through pure sport with people who had earned, like, sold a business for, like, 100 million pounds or, and, like, done these things and people looked at them differently, like, like, you're the man and what, what, I gotta bow down to you. I would never ever battle, like, from an ego place. I would always just be respectful and know that they had information and knowledge and experience that I didn't have that I could learn from. But I never would look at them as though they're better than anyone else, like or better than me. Yeah. Because what you do in life and what you achieve and how much money you have and how much accolades or what, what how other people perceive you, that's not the cause of what makes you all good. Yeah. So I think that was a blessing because I I don't know I would sit in meetings with these people that they had this big identity and I I just like saw them just as same as me. Yeah, yeah, same yeah. person. Yeah. Now one thing you have got very right with Pure Sport is your community. Mm. I do say very frequently every time I, you, you, you know, Pure Sport comes up in conversation with anyone, clients, fans, et cetera, that you have one of the best communities in London for your brand. Mm. Was that always a plan or did that sort of just happen naturally? No, nah, that just happened by accident because um, it's funny right the, the run club is obviously yeah. kind of what I'm leaning into yeah, but like yeah. mm. a lot of people have tried it and a lot of people have failed right mm. but you guys seem to have built something that is just I yeah. mean it's it's an incredible level not necessarily the size of the people that turn up which is obviously a lot but also mm. the passion behind that how, how did that happen? 
Yeah, it was just by accident. Um, because, again, like, the whole concept behind the brand and every ethos, every part of the ethos was providing a place of belonging to let people know you're good as you are, challenge mm. the status quo, question things, <coughs> know in this moment you're good. Um, and then as we were building the business, and and as you know, a startup is relentless, it's non-stop, especially for the founder, like yeah. you wake up before you're even fully awake, your mind's thinking of the business, what you like, things, ideas, solutions, issues. It's, it's relentless. Um, and I noticed, like, I wasn't training as frequently and because I'd stopped playing rugby and my mm. training was very, like, scheduled and yep. outlined for me as a rugby player, so you just do it. And um, one day we are in the office and a good friend of mine, Will Gooch, who loves running, who does these crazy running challenges, Crazy um, running challenges. Yeah. We were in the office and I was like, man, like, I'm feeling like quite tired and lethargic. And I think it's because I'm not training as much because I'm working so much and I don't yeah. have a routine. And he was like, oh, let's just go for some runs sometimes from the office. And I was like, yeah, cool. And then because like big part of our growth was like connecting with ambassadors yes. and like them sharing through social media, we had a good like network. And then him and I went for a run one day and I, and I went for a run with him and I came back to the office after the run and it was like three o'clock and that was a time where I'd usually feel like started to feel like a real crash and like real unproductive mm. and I just felt like energized yeah I was like oh, that was cool man um and then we started doing that more frequently we invited some ambassadors down and then one day we were, we were like this is fun man this is cool I feel energized I feel good doing it. it's cool to share it with people um and then one day him and I were running and then we were like should we start a run club and we're like yeah, yeah let's do a run club literally no idea plan nothing we just put it out on social media um come meet here I think about 20 odd people turned up and we were running and but Will is very much aligned to me like he he's just a very um when he interacts with people he just wants people to know like hey like we're in this together like, nice. you're with me we're one, we're one and the same and that was our what we did we weren't trying to do it we that's just how we connect with people we're just grateful that they came along they were sharing it with us and they were part of it so i think very early on with the run club because there was no material or business outcome or concept aligned to like marketing or anything it was just we were literally just doing it because we were like oh running it's fun it makes us feel good and yeah it's cool to do it with people um it just started to gain traction and then um as it grew and then the team grew i just said to people i said hey the only mission for all of us who work here at pure sport when we do the run club is just interact with people not in a forced way but when they're here just let them know that they belong here that's all like you don't have to tell them nothing but just when you interact just let them know like this is a space for you um and that's the only proviso i ever gave about mm. pure sport run club um and i think i think that's why people like it because they come along you don't pay you've got no obligation to do anything and people in a place like london they're just looking to connect with like-minded people with and feel like they they belong so i saw a tiktok about a week ago or so, when I was kind of having a little bit to catch up on what you guys are doing, about a guy who moved to London. I don't mm. know if you know this guy, but there's a guy that's moved to London and he's come from Nottingham. Um, I'll actually try and send it to you so you can maybe reach out to him, but he's come from Nottingham. He knows no one in London mm. and he's made more friends at your run club than yeah. anywhere else. And yeah. he's made a few TikToks about it and the stories are amazing. Yeah. But that level of connection and that level of not being mm. a commercial brand and for, uh, not necessarily a commercial focus, sorry, and actually focusing on community. Mm. Do you think in a weird way it is one of the biggest drivers f for the brand? Yeah, man. Like, people come to me now like, oh, man, like, you're a marketing genius. I'm like, I'm really actually <laughs> not, man. It was just pure luck. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people, oh, but they, like, stories like that, it's my, like, I love those the most yeah. about Pure Sport, right? Because building a business can be really hard sometimes. Uh, and tiring um, <laughs> and you forget sometimes the like that purpose and meaning mm. but then those ones always bring me back to, oh yeah this way, this this way, way. yeah um, and I think yeah it's, people often ask me I get people reach out to me like oh mate like I'm starting a business I want to build it like 
community focus like you it's such a powerful marketing tool can you give me any tips and my number one tip would be don't build it for marketing mm. just be a person who wants to connect with people and utilize the business as an opportunity to do that yeah because i think one thing i have learned is like humans do feel more comfortable when there's like some type of tangible thing there yeah like if i'm just like hey guys come hang out with me we'll all feel like we belong together people are like you're weird bro like <laughs> whereas if it's like oh we're gonna do a run club and it's under yeah. the banner of this business and yeah. come hang out because actually like honestly man 90 something percent of those people don't even really come to run they yeah. just come to hang you can go well, and I mean, run the guy, the guy on TikTok I, I think yeah. he's there for friendship he's there yeah. for sense of purpose yeah. he's there for you know but what the running does for. is it makes people feel comfortable that there's yeah. a reason why you're coming to do something yeah because people are a bit I don't know like people don't like to be vulnerable mm. so if you uh, you provide a place and a reason you know it's the same with like the products like supplements are cool like they're amazing and they can do profound things to the body but they're not like the answer no. They're not. They're not going to heal your everything. They're not going to fix you. They're they're actually a symbol or an, a, or a tool for you to explore yourself and yeah. understand yourself and your lifestyle more. It's almost like you're investing in saying, okay, if I buy this thirty five pound pot of capsules, yeah, it might do some cool stuff within my body, but yeah. like, it ain't the answer. It yeah. ain't the fix. But by doing that, you're taking a step to explore and understand how you can live better mm. mentally and physically. Mm. Um, it's the same with coming to a run club. It's like, oh, okay, I took that step to feel like I can put myself out of my comfort zone. You know, I can be vulnerable and open and connect with people more freely. Yeah. Um, and then I think the cool thing about Pure Sort Run Club is I see amazing friendships arise. Mm. I see people create their own clubs. I've yeah. seen people create their own brands. Like... Uh, I've seen amazing relationships and groups of friends like arising. I'm like, fuck yeah, like that's just opening people up to the capacity that they have to just be themselves more, mm. you know? And obviously there was a kind of what I would call Pure Sport 1.0, the first version of it with the brand and everything. Yeah. I feel like you're not product led necessarily right now from everything you said, mm. but were you product led on that first version of the brand? Do you, do you know what I mean by that first version, mm. that kind of initial phase? Because yeah. there was traction there, but since yeah. that rebrand since the refocus and the realignment and obviously some change through experience it feels like you've you've changed the path am i right in saying that um yeah i mean i think i've always been like like i really enjoy like design yeah um and i don't know it's more just like a fun hobby or f expression that i enjoy mm. i think like I had to do a job and I wasn't a rugby player. Now what I've learned, like, I would love to be some type of, like, designer or yeah. something like that. Like, But I don't have, like, the skills to, like, bring things to life with beautiful design mm. through, like, um, you know, like the graphic design software and, yeah. and I'm not good at drawing or anything like You've that. You've got it in the ideas. It's just the yeah. execution of getting out. So, like, I love seeing something that I, as a feeling or an idea come to life and look beautiful and be like, oh, that yeah. represents the feeling or the concept or idea of what I would have loved it to look like. Mm. That's why I really love doing the apparel. Yes. Um, and so I do think from the start of Pure Sport, because, because Pure Sport was started with 5,000 pounds out the front of my living room. I had 200 bottles of CBD oil, that was it. And like a dealer there was almost. no yeah <laughs> and i was going to rugby training to my teammates being like hey because i wasn't allowed to promote it because my contract said you're not allowed to promote cbd oh, really so i was Wait, just is this 2018 2018 yeah 2018 yeah, yeah. so i was like going to training but like, hey boys like there's this product cbd man and it's certified for athletes i can get it it's <laughs> sick and they'll be like yeah give me some <laughs> and they'll bring it to training they'll buy it off me and that's how it started to build i had no packaging yeah but but just because there was no money to do it. Mm. But, like, I remember looking at the bottles and being like, this is an amazing product. Like, I know the quality. Mm. I know how good it is. But I want every element of it to represent that. And I want it to be something that people feel drawn to as a, like, like a symbol mm -hmm. and a meaning. And so what I, that... And, and, and I also just wanted 
the brand that I was building for me to look at and be like, fuck yeah, that's sick. Like yeah. that looks cool. Yeah, yeah. You know, so the every the rebrand was just a cool like big moment. But everything up until that point, I was just constantly trying to find ways to refine it. Yeah. Like I'd had like three different packaging designs. I remember the packaging that. with all the colors as well. Yeah. Do you remember that one with all yeah. the like bright colors in yeah. there? Remember, that was the yeah. first time I saw it. Yeah. Um, and then from there to now, it's like, well, but you've kept the colors, you've kept little accents yeah. to it. Yeah. But the apparel you mentioned, which I think is again, and when people probably call you a marketing genius, I think is a big piece, but like, a lot of brands do much, right? In quotation yeah. marks, but you guys have taken it to another level. Has that been, what's the reason behind that? Apart from obviously your kind of passion and love for it, you know, why do you think that's been so important to what you guys do? Um, I, I grew up like in a way that we didn't have a lot at all. And when I had an older brother who's three years older and when, when we would get like, like, but there was just certain things that we loved, mm. like, we loved uh, like throwback basketball singlets. Yeah. Um, we loved our like Nike Air Max. We loved um, like old school college um, hoodies and the varsity hoodies yeah. and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so there was just these things that we absolutely loved, and but we were like connoisseurs of them. Like, mm. like we didn't. But when you'd get your hands on something, so we'd go on like eBay from New Zealand. And like nowadays, like things are so accessible everywhere around yeah, the like world. Yeah, like Depop and stuff. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. But but back then, man, like especially living in New Zealand, no websites would send anything to New Zealand. Really. So like to get stuff there was really hard. Mm. So like, and also like we didn't have the money. So like when we would want something, we'd like try to figure out a way to get it, and like um, we'd go on like eBay and like order like these one-off like college basketball singlets that meant a lot to us yeah because that's something that we were passionate about um and we just loved the designs and the colors and the things like that and almost like that was like our we had like a uniform mm. our way of dressing was like a uniform in our neighborhood um and then you'd trade with your friends and you'd swap your um you know hoodie for his one because you know like you couldn't afford to buy a new one but you'd swap and that was yeah. that was your new one and like so that's just been something that I've just grown up like was a passion of mine mm. and like the detail and the colors and the fonts and all these things. Um, and then also like playing rugby and getting your first like club jacket or like your rep team jacket where it said the name across the back. That was more more than a piece of clothing that yeah. was like, wow, like I'm part of this. Mm. It's you like know? your armor in a way, isn't yeah. it? It's your armor, it's your uniform, yeah. it's your protector. And yeah, your that was like way, yeah. a representation of something that you're truly part of, mm. that you're proud to be part of. So for me, uh, the apparel with Pure Sport, that was just an expression of my passion for those things that yeah. have meant a lot to me throughout my life. And then I realized like anyone can, you can buy sick, amazing, cool brands and quality anywhere and everywhere it's so accessible now um so then i was like why would people want to buy a pure sport hoodie or a t-shirt and then the, and then i realized the reason why is because they can buy anyone can buy like the nike mm. hoodies and all that yeah, yeah. anywhere anytime but people like to have something that they feel aligns to something that they're truly part of mm. and for me pure sport has always been creating a brand and a business that it is something that people are part of. It's not just a transaction. The the product's a symbol, right? Mm. It's, it's the the, com the community is a place of belonging. Yeah. Um. So for me, like the apparel is, it's something for people to wear to represent. I'm part of this movement. Um. And yeah, it, it also just happened by accident because I realised it was kind of boring for our ambassadors to just promote the product. Yeah. So I wanted. Pure sport to rep and, I, and pure sport always was representing a lifestyle and a way of life and a mindset. So, and then I also wanted an excuse to make some cool hoodies and stuff because yeah, yeah. that was something I cared about. Yeah. So I just made some hoodies and t-shirts. And uh, the first thing was like a hoodie, a t-shirt, a hat, and a basketball singlet. And they were all just things that I wanted to wear. <laughs> um, so I just made those, but I made them for our ambassadors. And I remember I only made like thirty of thirty or so things. Yeah. But I just made them to the highest quality and as cool as I could. Because I was like, no one likes that protein powder brand T-shirt that they send out that kind of shrinks in the wash, mm. peels off, and isn't actually that cool. Yeah. Uh, 
But if I can create a hoodie and a t-shirt and a hat that people think is cool and they just want to wear it, then the return on um, them wearing that and the feeling that they get when they wear it, that's going to do a thousand times better job than me spending cheaper and money on buying, getting a t-shirt that's kind of yeah. shitty. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and it sort of paid off because then, like, they were wearing it and I'll just notice our ambassadors who had cool, like, some of our ambassadors sponsored by, like, Nike and Adidas and all these cool brands, mm. but they were wearing the Pure Sport hoodie in their yeah, own yeah. time. So I was like, fuck. Ah. And then people started messaging me, like, oh can we buy the hoodie <laughs> and then i actually would feel bad because i'd be like oh you actually can't buy the hoodie not because <laughs> yeah, yeah. i'm trying to be an asshole but no, like yeah. i just don't have yeah, any yeah. i can't i don't have enough of those hoodies yeah um, that must be an amazing feeling yeah it was cool. in a very it's kind of subtle yeah. way that, that they really want to do that yeah uh, uh, at first it was like yeah i was like oh shit that's cool like the most amazing feeling was seeing the ambassadors wearing the hoodie in their own mm. time i was like fuck that's cool man yeah um and then when people would ask I didn't allow the feeling of like that's cool because I just at firstly feel bad because I'm like fuck, I feel bad saying people they can't get something they want that I feel like I should be able to provide to them. Mm. So then eventually I was just like, oh yeah, I'm gonna make like fifty of each of these and like sell them. And then doing that, the margins are so bad. Yeah, it's not a good like <laughs> yeah. business thing. Yeah. but I was just like, I just feel bad telling no to people all the time, so I just want to yeah. provide it. And then it, that's just how it kind of evolved and evolved there. yeah and yeah. now i mean you have a pretty large scope of products within apparel right yeah yeah we do like we do apparel drops like every few months and we do about like 10 or 12 and they sell out fast as well yeah it sells out quick and then i know i ride my bike around and i see people wearing the socks and the hoodies i'm like yeah fuck, sick hoodie. <laughs> and they're like yeah and then some of them are like oh yeah that's you yeah I'm like, cool. and then other people look at me like who's this weirdo telling me i got a cool hoodie but yeah 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 and and obviously you know as a brand you have such a range of products you've got everything from the nootropic side obviously the cbd side as well the mushrooms etc the apparel You've always had a very interesting outlook from the kind of content that you guys put out around, you know, pricing and discounting. Obviously, we've just gone past Black Friday mm -hmm. and every Black Friday, we always hear from you in some way around that. Mm -hmm. do, do you think brands are getting it wrong with just always discounting products, always doing bundles? And, and what's your perception? What's the brand's perception? Because I really enjoy the way you look at it. Yeah. Uh, well, I just think of it from my perspective. Like, if I see a brand always discounting all the time, I just don't trust, like the price mm. like like why is that why do you have a retail price if you're just constantly on discount mm. like let's just be transparent yeah like, i don't know it seems like you're trying to fool people into buying something because it's on sale mm. like just let just have your price as your price and and back your product and just people buy it if they like buy it at the fair price yeah like just be transparent um and and the, the reason we do uh we do like two sales a year is because these products are new to a lot of people yes and a lot of people are sensitive to the price or they don't realize like how they can utilize this product and it's new to them so they're learning and so my concept of um and pure sort products aren't cheap because we mm. do manufacture them in the, the highest quality way possible and get the, the highest quality uh, raw ingredients and um so we're not like cutting corners so our products aren't cheap yeah um and so i i look at the doing a sale as an opportunity for people that are curious and questioning it but the they don't understand what it might do to them or how they can utilize it and the price is a barrier to that we do sales as an opportunity for them to try something for the first time and it. see if it's for them yeah um and and remove that barrier that some people have um and then as well like people that love it and they are loyal like i'm like wow oh, man stock up if you want to stock up for a year <laughs> go ahead hey. crack on yeah nice yeah. so what is got what is 2024 kind of got in store for you and the, and the brand you know what what are you wanting to achieve in the next sort of 365 days yeah i just want to continue the inward path of being happy and peaceful and express it to the world mm. and my hope is that pure sport will continue to be a, a really cool vehicle for that um and i think if that is the case and that is how the brand continues to grow and evolve we will continue to draw more people and gain momentum and um yeah like help people understand like hey like 
you don't need more, you don't need to achieve something. Don't matter what your past was, like you're good. Like you could sit in a room with a dude who sold his business for a hundred million and you might have just come out of uni and he's no better than you. Like mm. you're good. You could teach you could teach him a thing or two mm. and he could teach you a thing or two. But it's all fun and games. Um and yeah, same for me in my life. Like yeah, I've had some big challenges this year. Probably one of the most difficult years for me personally. Mm. Um in terms of like circumstances, changes, challenges, yeah. difficulties. Um and I and I just see it as an opportunity, like when you know when I lost my dad and the difficulties that uh, I faced through that and the and the heartache and the pain and the destructiveness, I now think of that as one of the biggest blessings that I've ever had in life. Mm. Um, and it allowed me to understand more clearly who I am. And mm. like, so, and then I carry my dad's with me every day, yeah. you know. Um, so I just want to continue deepening the understanding and then allowing whatever transpires because like if you are living true within your heart not from the conceptual mind um if you're living true within your heart your ability to create and connect is it's infinite beyond your imagination Mm. um and you don't know what that might look like either there's things within you that that can evolve and things within life that can transpire that your conceptual mind doesn't even know because your conceptual mind is recycled thoughts and ideas, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I just want to keep exploring that and letting things unfold from there. Amazing. And what what should we look out for with Pure Sport in 24? I'm sure you've got some cool plans. Uh, yeah, I'm sure there's some cool products that are in the pipeline. I'm sure there's some cool apparel designs. I'm sure there's some cool brand collaborations, uh, some cool events. Um, I think there's... What did you wait and see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't really even know right now. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Well, mate, congratulations, I think. It's Thank been you. a pleasure to chat with you and congrats on the success because from one kind of business owner to another, I know how hard it is. And um, I'm really excited to see what you guys do in the next couple of years. Um, But yeah, thank you again and congrats. Thank you so much, man. It's been a pleasure to chat. Cheers.